The Bridgerton in the title, of course, refers to the unofficial Bridgerton musical, which was announced to take place at the Kennedy Center and ran by Abigail Barlow and Emily Bear. Despite encouraging the duo previously, Netflix cracked down hard on this one. So the question is, what was different this time, and why are fans actually siding with the big media giant? You'll understand the situation completely by the end of this video, so stick around. First of all, just who are Emily Bear and Abigail Barlow? The two women in question are young musicians, 20 and 23 respectively. Abigail is a singer-songwriter, and aside from the Bridgerton stuff, is most well-known for the indie pop hit Heartbreak Hotel, a song which peaked number two on iTunes and racked up over 6.5 million streams. Emily has the same job titles, but also has a storied history as a pianist and composer. She actually made a few appearances on The Ellen DeGeneres Show at the age of six, and debuted at Carnegie Hall at age nine, so suffice it to say, she was viewed as something of a prodigy growing up. And since these are modern young musicians we're talking about, they're of course huge sensations on TikTok, which is where they most mostly came to fame. In 2021, the two paired up to write the unofficial Bridgerton musical, live streaming writing and recording sessions, and slowly releasing songs, even taking on viewer suggestions in the works. These were wildly popular, and it wasn't long before they started performing the songs live on stage. In September of 2021, they released a full 15-song concept album that blew up big time. By that point, the alliteratively titled Bear and Barlow had raked in more than 200 million views and 48 million likes on TikTok. This album even ended up scoring the 20 2022 Grammy Award for Best Musical Theater Album, which, okay now that I say it out loud, sounds incredibly specific. How many of those actually release in a year? Still, it's not every day that you're winning prestigious and world-famous awards for what is essentially fan art at the end of the day. Incidentally, Bear is the youngest artist to ever get nominated, let alone win an award in this category. Obviously having a knack for the musical business, the two were also hired by Taco Bell to write the music for Mexican Pizza, the musical. That, uh, sounds like a joke, but it's it's merely a statement of fact. While the show has still not yet premiered, we can only hope it features the iconic bell sound every 30 seconds or so. So, what is this lawsuit about? What happened here? It really sounds like everything was going swimmingly for Bear and Barlow, and they were being showered in acclaim quite regularly. So where did it all go wrong? Well, as stated, the two began performing the songs at their live shows, which wasn't seemingly much of an issue at first. But there is a difference between having a singular song in a greater set and having entire live concerts put on in the name of Bridgerton. That is, of course, to say, the unlicensed name. And once the album was released and ended up getting so hugely acclaimed, they couldn't help but want to take that step. It is worth reiterating that this whole time, they've never had an official tie to the show or to the franchise as a whole. It's said that a license was offered at some point, but for reasons we'll probably never be able to grasp, the offer was declined and they set about doing the musical without the official support of any IP owner. The first such live concert took place at the Kennedy Center, where they performed it alongside the National Symphony Orchestra. This was a sold-out venue at 100 $150 a ticket, which makes it a pretty huge success, except for the fact that it was technically, kinda sorta, completely illegal. It was made clear ahead of time that this was a step too far for the owners of the Bridgerton IP, that being Netflix, Shondaland, and original author Julia Quinn. They were warned with legal action if this went ahead, and, as we said, an offer was made to let them legally purchase the license. But instead, they went ahead with the show as is, and as a result, a lawsuit has been filed against Barr and Barlow for copyright infringement on a massive scale. But, didn't the show creators encourage the two women in their previous Bridgerton fan works? It's true, up to this point, while there was never a contractual relationship between the two ladies and the heads of the show, they had been on good terms for quite a while. Much of the show's cast had spoken about being fans of the two's work, and Netflix's own Twitter account shouting out the two and heaping praise on the musical back in its formation on the TikTok days. It's worth noting that when they were set to release a full album of songs based on Bridgerton, they likely would have had the legal power to strike down on this, but agreed not to do anything to interfere with it. They seemed to have everyone rooting them on at one point. They were the only women nominated for the Grammy that they won, and also pushed the industry forward by being the first to win a prestigious award for a musical developed on TikTok. But the past live appearances weren't explicitly profiting off the Bridgerton brand, and it's hard to argue that the show at the Kennedy Center absolutely was. So, what's the fan reaction to this been like? Are they really siding with Netflix? Well, it's probably not accurate to say that fans are all that sympathetic with the faceless giant mega corporation that ultimately owns Bridgerton and more the creators behind the show. Those being Shonda Rhimes, owner of Shondaland, who had made the show, and Julia Quinn, the writer of the novels the show is based upon. The two of them each spoke out on the need for protecting intellectual property. Quinn in particular seems to have struck a nerve saying, quote, I would hope that Barlow and Bear, who share my position as independent creative professionals, understand the need to protect other professionals' intellectual property, end quote. A number of TikTok creators, with some experience in the world of law, took to the platform to lambast Barlow and Bear for their blatant breaking 
of the law. Anyone with a solid understanding of the law would be able to tell you that what they've done is far beyond the scope of fair use and is practically the textbook definition of what copyright laws were created to prevent. Lydia Pallas Lauren, a professor at Lewis and Clark who happens to claim copyright law as a specialty states, quote, copyright monetizes and propertizes our shared cultural experiences. Fair use says we can play with that culture without the permission of the property owner, except when you make money. Then you have to worry about the property owner, end quote. But even those without a law degree can probably understand the issue. And what's more, it's feared that if this open and shut case ends up going to court, the precedent of the ruling may negatively affect content creators around the world, as far as harming the idea of fair use. With that in mind, it's not hard to understand why the majority of fans are siding with the creators here, as nobody should be willing to suffer on account of Baron Barlow's blunder. You know, I'm starting to get paranoid that somewhere along the way, I've mixed up the typical order of those names. You'd let me know if I did that, right? It's supposed to be a specific order, like the aforementioned Lewis and Clark or Abbott and Costello. Of course, Johnson and Johnson, you'd never live it down if you mixed that one up. But hold on, what about the Ratatouille musical? Why didn't that get the same outcry? Ah yes, the first ever TikTok musical, Ratatouille the Musical, also known as Ratatouzical, was also a fan creation. In fact, it was a pretty big collaboration of a number of fans contributing to turn a comedic tribute song into a full-blown show which was eventually streamed around the world. This got an entirely different response, with Disney and their actors even helping contribute to it in the end. However, that was not only non-profit, but a charity event raising money for the Actors Fund, a good and fitting cause. What's more, this was in late 2020, beginning of 2021, when this occurred, when much of the world was still shut down from the major pandemic, making it a particularly fine time for such a charity event. That has practically nothing in common with this event, really. We're just getting out ahead of that one, as the two show two very opposing sides of the same coin. And that's all the time we have for today. There's no denying that the creators are in the legal right to can the musical, but would you agree that they're in the moral right as well? Where do you think the line should be drawn as it pertains to fair use and fan creations? Are there any similar stories that you'd like to see us cover? Be sure to let us know your thoughts down in the comments below, and until next time, thanks for watching.